Today I want to have a real conversation about rebuilding our infrastructure. And I want to welcome three guests who will share, I guess you could say, programs, ideas, and even initiatives that are already underway. And these are going to be able to provide some tangible next steps to actually rebuild our infrastructure. All while inspiring and encouraging all of you as the next generation to get involved. But first, I want to share some of my thoughts. All of us know that we have an aging infrastructure, right? We've talked about it so many times. And we also have talked about how we need more funding. Now, the EPA says we need roughly $473 billion in drinking water infrastructure investment during the next 20 years. For an entire video, we could talk about the ASCE report card and the poor grades it had given to our infrastructures like rail, waterways, bridges, anything in transportation. You know, we've talked about this so many times before. In fact, if you wanted me to do a video or something on that, we could talk about that as well. But the lack of funding is widely reported. But I recently came across a survey that has me thinking, and I wanted to share this with you. J.D. Power released its 2019 Water Utility Residential Customer Satisfaction Survey. Now here's what's interesting. The ability for water utilities to successfully upgrade and replace pipes and treatment and storage facilities is dependent on how they will communicate with customers. Now we're talking more than funding and it adds a whole new twist. Now let's assume for a minute that we have all the funding in the world to rebuild our infrastructure. Now I know you gotta imagine this and I know it's probably unrealistic, but let's just imagine for a minute. What happens next? We need to dig into how we're going to do it and that it's going to require all the use of technology in so many different forms Contractors will need technology on the job site to be more efficient. Utilities will need technology to communicate with all the customers. And we will need to build technology right into our infrastructure to be more proactive and predictive in the future. Everyone involved will need technology in hand. Perhaps that's the conversation we need to start having. And it begins right now. The Stark Area Regional Transit Authority provides 2.4 million rides a year to seniors, students, veterans, individuals with disabilities, and more to those in Ohio. It operates 34 fixed routes that travel through Stark County, with two routes traveling to Akron and one route traveling to Cleveland. Recently, I talked to Kurt Conrad, CEO and Executive Director of the Stark Area Regional Transit Authority, all about his initiatives. Kurt, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. So, Kurt, there's a lot of things happening in Ohio, and especially what you're doing with SARTA. Can you explain that all to our, our viewers right now? Sure. There's several things that we're working on, and probably the most notable is um, our fuel cell technology vehicles. Right now, we have seven fuel cell um, buses that are powered by hydrogen, and by the end of the year, that number should be up to 17, which will make us one of the largest in the Western Hemisphere um, of that technology. Um, and for, for your viewers, what a fuel cell uh, vehicle is, it takes hydrogen from a tank uh, and it goes into a fuel cell, which converts it into electricity through a, um, a chemical process. Uh, um, not like our current vehicles was an internal combustion engine but it that burns it but this is a straight chemical process that creates electricity um, then that electricity goes to drive electric motors on the bus so it's a literally a non it's a zero emission vehicle and the only thing that comes out of the tailpipe is water and so what we're talking about is an EV I mean what everybody talks about is this is an electric vehicle a fuel cell vehicle what really is this for a new way of looking at the city I mean is, is it, it how, how does your citizens look at this technology so yeah it is an EV we, we kind of say it's the other the other electric bus um, in some ways. But it, it is an EV, it's, it's, electric, it's electric vehicle. Um, our community really uh, likes this technology. The state of Ohio is very supportive of it. Um, historically, and why this project has happened here, 
Um, the state of Ohio has, has the third largest fuel cell industry in the country behind California and Connecticut. And then locally, we have the NASA Glenn Research Center, which is head of all of the power programs for NASA. And historically, all of the, the going back to the Saturn rockets, have had fuel cells on board to create electricity. So we have a pretty deep um, network here and, and ecosystem for fuel cells, and that's why it's allowed us to be successful. Is the goal what you guys want to be is the template or the role model for other cities and communities to understand that this is the next generation of what technology is going to be when we talk about this digital transformation that we're experiencing right now? Yeah, we, we've actually been kind of placed ourselves as a model to what other cities and other communities can do um, across the country. Interestingly enough, we had a couple of years ago the North American Fuel Cell Bus Conference here in Canton. We had people from Canada. We had people from, from England here. Um, interestingly enough, we've, we've been doing some kind of cross comparisons with fleets in Scotland and discussions in, in, in Australia. So we, we've um, kind of become not only a national kind of uh, a, uh, but I just got an email from British Railway the other day asking about our experiences. So we've our our projects and what we've been doing here um, have had reaches just even beyond our country. Well, when you when you look at all this technology and we look at what we're building it, for the future, when we are building our cities and we change the landscape. How does EVs and autonomous vehicles, all of these things, how are we reimagining what our cities are going to be like from urban and rural communities to accommodate, like what you have, 2.5 million citizens overall? Well, I think the big thing is, is that we, we need to reduce the footprint, uh, the greenhouse gas footprint of transportation in general. Um, a couple of years ago, transportation took over the the largest emitter of CO2 in our country. So really, if we're going to try to have an impact on that, we have to electrify transportation. So it really is a fundamental change in how we have looked at um, how how transportation works. And and really, the either the electric infrastructure or the hydrogen infrastructure um, is something that we have to start planning to implement and plan to move forward. Um, and if we don't, um, you know, it's going to create some issues as, as we move down the road. Is this really what we're talking about? We're talking about now having a greener footprint. You know, that's what we're talking about. Or are we talking about our next generation? They don't really want to own cars. They want to be taken from here to there, point A to point B. Or is it a combination of things? And this is what we're really looking at when we reimagine the future of what our communities are going to look like. I think it's a combination of, 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 of two things. One trend going on, you know, basically there's a lot of people that have more letters after them, their name than I do, will say that the internal combustion engine has reached its maximum efficiency. And if we're going to try to reduce emissions and increase range, the electrification of transportation is where we're going to have to go regardless. And I think you can see that even our fuel cell bus, where we're getting about double the mileage um, out of a kilogram of hydrogen versus a, a, a gallon of diesel. So that's one thing that's going on. The other thing too is that you're starting to see the merger of of all types of transportation. Whereas, you know, you know, we're moving away from the idea of being a bus company to being a mo uh, managers of mobility. And the interesting thing is that within the last two years, I've had um, ongoing discussions and ongoing projects with with at least two different um, car companies themselves. Um, one, I think, one was is looking at um, you know, almost like Uber, but with an internal with with the transit system operating it and that platform is called transloc and the interesting thing about that they're owned by ford but the idea of what you're saying is this is going to help the disabled this is going to help the elderly we're changing the way we see things and this is also opens the door of innovation for how the construction industry how car companies how technology companies have to reimagine the way we think and the way we do things and and i always like to say for all of the construction industry we're limited by our imagination and this is why we have to rethink the way we construct things because our cities are going to have to be built differently to accommodate this new fuel cell, these new EVs, right? Yeah, the, we were looking at one of the issues, especially around autonomous buses or vehicles, how do you get 
an autonomous vehicle to stop at even a bus stop and actually have the infrastructure to allow an ADA passenger to get on those vehicles. Those are some of the kind of discussions we're having and how you solve that that issue is 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 it how, how do you how do you handle that? How do you handle an ADA rider using an Uber if they have a, a cognitive disability or even have some other type of disability that keeps them from using a phone? So there's a lot of issues when it comes to access. Wait, wait, now you're talking about something else, having people not use their phones. We've got a whole other issue, right? I mean, that's something else you're talking about. People don't want to put down their phones, Kurt. So. Uh, no, but in, the interesting thing is we, we did a... Um, um, some research or the ridership and about 80% of our riders have some type of phone. So it's, it is, it definitely is. Um, you mean it wasn't a hundred percent? I don't know how that could be. Uh, well, there's still some people that's, you know, the, the, you know, you know, like our grandparents that are 900 years old still haven't adopted <laughs> some of the technology yet. Um, so there, I mean, there is a technology bar barrier, so to speak on some, with some folks, but it is, it's definitely has, um, you know, been adopted, so to speak. So are you really, I would imagine right now you are going out and just giving talk after talk after talk because this has to be really a very hot topic for communities that have to say, this is where we have to go because as our baby boomers are getting older and we have the next generation moving into this, we really have to see this as being something that every community has to think about and reimagine what they have to do. It is, and I, you know, I've been a number of places across the country. And one of the things we just launched was a borrow bus program, where any transit system or city could actually borrow one of our fuel cell buses and try it out and test it out. And literally next or this week, we're going to be down in Washington D.C. taking around the city. We're, we're so that. Wilmata, which is the transit system in D.C., will be looking at it, and some other ones in the suburban areas. Uh, we'll be in Chicago later this month. We'll be on the West Coast. Um, so it's almost like, uh, you know, when they say the tour bus, it's the bus is the tour, and we'll be coming to a city near you. So we're having a lot of discussions about, you know, zero emission technology and how that has to work in communities. Realistically, when will we start seeing fuel buses like this, when we talk about EVs, more of these fuel cell buses in communities that will really be doing this type of service, when will we see it in operation that we could say from community to community community, when will we see it? Well, you're starting to already see um, the proliferation of, of uh, fuel cell vehicles across the country. California is the leader. Um, they have a requirement by 20, I think it's 2040, that all their all their buses have to be zero emissions. So there is a t there is a hard driver from from California to do that, so to speak. We we launched uh, the Midwest uh, Center for for Hydrogen, and we have a number of participants in that that collaborative all over the Midwest, from uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and you're starting to even see those vehicles deployed there. So I start I, you're starting to see. Um, the interest in it, but you're also starting to see the cost coming down um, to be, we think probably within 24 months uh, to 36 months that the co will be on par with the cost of a uh, diesel electric bus to uh, a fuel cell or battery electric bus. So we're not only talking about having to get the right buses to do this, we're talking about having to build the infrastructure to make all this happen in the Midwest, on the West Coast, and to really bring our streets together because you can't go from one city that doesn't have it to the next. We have to get city to city to really support these efforts, right? In the long term, that, that's correct. And California has kind of used that, that model. Whereas it, we're, we're trying to use more what's called a tethered fleet concept is where um, either a transit system or a trucking company or that can be kind of the leading um, adopter of it. So you put the station there and those vehicles come back to that station and then start building the, the network that way. So you can use, you can more or less try to use market forces to to do the adoption versus government policy or regulation is what we think is going to happen here in the Midwest to be the best. So pretty much saying we don't want to have to regulate it. We want everyone to be excited about it and make it all happen, correct? It seems like that for the Midwest and outside, outside the, there's 13 states that have what they call zero emission requirements. And outside of those 13 states, we think the approach that we're trying to take, a market-oriented tethered uh, fleet adoption, is, is probably where we're going to go. Well, I have to tell you, Kurt Conrad, CEO and Executive Director of the Sarda Area Regional Transit Authority, thank you so much for spending time with us today. You'll have to tell us about when you bring that bus to our city, we'll have to check it out.
Uh, we'll make sure I send you notices. And if you're ever here in Canton, you can stop by us. And you can also see the Football Hall of Fame if you're here locally. All right. I love it. Thank you so much, Kurt. We appreciate okay. your time today. Thank you. Located along the Detroit River, the Charter County of Wayne, Michigan, is at the center of the automotive capital of the Midwest, Detroit. Today we will look at how this county is leveraging public-private partnerships to move critical infrastructure projects along and how it is becoming a lab for new technologies and concepts. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to talk with Tom Kelly, the Director of Capital Development and Building Administration for the Charter County of Wayne, Michigan. Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So Tom, let's talk about the current market conditions and what's happening in Detroit. Uh, well, we've seen a pretty remarkable um, rebound in both residential and commercial activity over the past couple years. Uh, really coming out of 2013 when the city exited bankruptcy uh, is when you saw um, sort of a renewed excitement with, with um, the urban core. Uh, Detroit, you know, as, as a lot of folks know, uh, suffered significant population loss and economic investment over the past 50 years. Uh, the city peaked at about 1.8 million in the 1960 census and then dropped to just under 700,000 in the last census. Uh, so it's been a very welcome um, recent trend. Uh, you know, we are uh, in the same boat as a lot of uh, cities are right now. Uh, you have uh, sort of this imbalance in supply and demand of residential commercial activity or, or, or uh, residential commercial um, offerings. You have um, construction costs, which have continued to trend upwards. Uh, you have, um, you know, impacts from tariffs. It's good, but yet, nonetheless, it provides a lot of challenges for developers with yeah. time and budget and kind of things. So what, what should they look for? What should they think about when coming to Detroit and wanting to do things? Because I think now's a good time. I think we talk about this bubble that's coming yet. Should we be fearful? What, what should they really think about? Because I think right now we still have a lot of opportunities when we think about infrastructure, when we think about development. There really is a lot of things that they could be doing as a developer right now and really thinking about updating and improving and i think detroit you just mentioned has has that opportunity well l let me touch on the bubble uh, first and foremost yeah. you know i i tend to be fairly pessimistic when it comes to uh, economic cycles myself uh, i think detroit's a bit u uniquely positioned just because it sunk so far that there is still a far way to go to even get to 2009 levels of um you know mortgage originations uh valuation in residential and commercial properties. Um, so even though there has been a significant uptick, um, there could be some ways to go. So if per se, you know, the the, the market as a whole, you know, the, the, the country's economy starts to take a little bit of a dip, um, I think Detroit has positioned itself fairly well to not be the canary in the mine like it was last time. I think that a lot of that access capacity is still there to be uh, sort of gobbled up. Um, you know, what developers can do, uh, it's a bit tricky at the local level, especially when you're doing it here in Detroit, because um, you do have significant costs that a lot of developers try to address through tax abatements. And so navigating the abatement uh, structure is something I would recommend folks to uh, take a hard look at early on. Uh, this obviously is legislated at the state level, you know, and can change from legislation or from administration to administration, legislature to legislature. Um, but having a thorough understanding of sort of what offerings are out there, um, whether it's a you know clean up brownfield sites, uh, whether it's uh, tax abatements of property taxes, real property uh, or whatnot, uh, coming in sort of armed with that type of information is really helpful to start the discussion with the county or the city or whoever. Uh, on putting a development forward, but also having a really um, thorough understanding of the workforce development system, you know, who is providing a lot of the new talent regionally, whether it's at the community college level, uh, providing stackable cred credentials, whether it's the workforce boards, uh, such as Michigan Works, uh, that, that seems to be the biggest problem. People come in, uh, especially institutional investors from across the country, and realize, well, I can't find enough plumbers, electricians, you know, HVAC repairmen, et cetera. Uh, and 
they need to figure out sort of the technical schools or the companies that are bringing forward uh, folks back into the, the workforce. Um, so I think those two things are really important as well. So now you talked about two things I have to address. The first thing is, you know, talking about the government. You know, that's a challenge because right now you yeah. don't know if, you know, we have an election coming up in 2020, so you don't know who's going to be in office. Are we going to have the Republicans again, the Democrats? That could change everything on what you're able to get, what you kind of look at. That's number one. Then you really talked about the skills part of it. You know, we have a skill shortage. We have about two million that we're talking about, and we're talking about going forward whether we can continue to get those plumbers, those trades that we need. I mean, we just saw what happened in Notre Dame, and where are we go we're never going to be able to find those kind of fine skills that we're able to do what was there in Paris. So when we think about these things, it, are we going to be able to have as those baby boomers retire? to be able to train and bring in that younger generation to want to be in construction to do the things that you just described. There's a lot that has to be done. So now I'm going to throw mm -hmm. the ball back at you and have you answer all these great questions. Yeah, I think the biggest challenge is the stigmatization linked to the trades. Uh, you know, I grew up in a, in a tradesman's household. My father was a uh, carpenter. I uh, did residential construction. My grandfather did residential construction. Uh, and, uh, you know, the the thought in the you know late 1990s early 2000s when I was sort of going off into my own was ah you know that's probably not the right path there are no jobs out there for you look elsewhere and I ended up going to college and you know sort of went your typical uh, liberal arts uh, path um, but that dynamic has changed quite a bit and it really starts at the middle school high school level the the problem with with skilled trades is you know there's a lag effect to the market so. You know, the investments we make today are really not going to pay off for another two, three, four, five years down the road. Uh, once people start entering the job market after an apprenticeship or after a, um, you know, a program at a community college or a trade school. Um, so, but it, it's, it's going to be there, right? And, you know, the pace of baby boomer retirement uh, necessitates that this is going to happen. So, you know, how you crack the problem today is you get a time machine and go back five years ago and you invest in this properly, uh, but that's not going to happen. So really, it's learn from the mistakes we've made previously and double down on technical training moving forward so that we're not stuck in the same position, sort of a neutral over the next couple of years. So there's a thing right now. So you look at what you're doing now in Detroit. You look at the opportunities and you look at what you can do right now. So we talked about we don't want another recession of 2009. Right. We don't want to, to make the repeat the same mistakes. What is Detroit saying is we're the place, we're the home of the future. We're going to do a lot of things, the future now. How do you see that for, for telling contractors and developers, this is the place you have to come. We've got some really great opportunities. How do you enc encourage the construction community to take a look at what you guys are doing? Well, I think you just look at the number of projects on the board right now. Um, you have major investments uh, from Ford Motor Company. You have a new international crossing. Uh, you have uh, Bedrock Real Estate, which is the parent, well, which is a subsidiary of Quicken Loans, a sort of a sister company, Quicken Loans, have uh, 17,000 people working downtown Detroit now. Uh, you have um, an increased investment of a lot of back offices from tech companies. Uh, you have Google that's opened a large office here. You have LinkedIn. You have Twitter. Um, what that is showing developers is, you know, the demographic that are taking those jobs um, are the ones demanding a lot of the uh, urban sort of lifestyle amenities. Uh, and you know, there have been various supports coming out of our da downtown development partnership that to keep pace with that demand, you'd have to build between 1,200 to 1,500 units of housing a year. Well, you look back in between 1990 and 1999, there were zero. Uh, multifamily uh, options built downtown Detroit. Uh, over the past couple of years, we've been delivering between 200 and 500 units per year. Uh, most of the buildings downtown have a six month or longer waiting list. We're at 98% capacity um, for a residential occupancy downtown. So I think for a developer, especially you know an out-of-state developer that's not familiar with the um, market, you know can really look at this pent-up demand 
uh, and the, the industries that are moving in are high growth industries that typically attract sort of your young 20s, 30s something individual that uh, is looking for um, sort of a walkable, sustainable transit oriented community, which downtown Detroit offers. Are we talking about a different urbanization that's going to occur, the types of businesses that you're seeing coming, what your type of building now is going to be completely different than what you thought you built 10 years ago. We're talking about the way the future generations are looking at what baby boomers looked at. I mean, you're building things completely different than what you've built in the past, homes, yeah, businesses. I Absolutely. I mean, you look at the building trends of the 70s and 80s, and it mm -hmm. was large, sprawling suburban office complexes, sort of self-contained uh, fortresses, if you will. And, and we actually have an example downtown, the Renaissance Center, where General Motors is, was sort of a contained city within a city. What you, what what you're seeing now is people are desiring sort of this interconnectedness, sort of the the, the Jane Jacobs, uh, you know, urban web of walkability. Um, sort of a campus setting, but not sort of a green, sprawling, um, uh, you know, college type campus, but very much a an urban campus where you're walking from brownstone to high rise. Um, people want uh, retail options that are ground level. Tom, tell me how these communities are coming together involving the construction industry and others. Well, depending on the city, um, a lot of um, places are going to community benefit agreements where if you have a development over a certain threshold, it requires some level of community involvement. Uh, and here in Detroit, we have that as part of city um, uh, city council's directive. And it's been really interesting to see that, that play out where you have uh, the first really was our new arena that went in a few years ago, which required Olympia Development, who uh, built it, um, to involve community leaders, set up sort of a, a, a community working group to talk about, uh, you know, building egress and uh, green space and public access and walkability. And it really did change the outcome. Instead of building this glass box, which typical arenas sort of uh, are, you have um, – a uh, building that's much more woven into the fabric of the community. And that model has really sort of proliferated to other big developments uh, that have gone on here. And I know the same thing has been happening in other cities where uh, sort of this this forced hand of the city has actually created a very um, collaborative environment and created a lot of goodwill between developers and people in the community as well. I think folks have always been afraid of watching new development happen and thinking, I'm going to be left behind. Um, but if you bring people in at the very beginning and say this is a partnership, this is a uh, community collaborative effort, uh, the outcome uh, tends to be far greater than what could have been. Well, I have to tell you, Tom Kelly, Director of Capital Development and Building Administration for the Charter County of Wayne, Michigan, thank you so much for spending time with me today. Of course. The Champ Clark Bridge was built in 1928. It is part of the U.S. Route 54 corridor, and it spans the Mississippi River connecting Louisiana, Missouri, with the state of Illinois. The new bridge is being designed and constructed using the design-build procurement method. Here to chat with me all about it is Brandy Baldwin, Deputy Project Director of the Champ Clark Bridge. Brandy, welcome to the show. Glad you could join us. Yeah, me too. Thanks for inviting me, Peggy. So, Brandy, let's talk about your project. I really enjoyed learning a little bit more about it, but let's talk about this exciting project you've been working on because it's clearly a complicated one. Yeah, so what, we're in Louisiana, Missouri, um, crossing the Mississippi River into Illinois. Um, our structure is named after uh, Champ Clark, and it's a 20-foot wide structure, so very narrow lanes. Um, it's a weight restricted bridge and we have a lot of trouble with trucks being able to, to cross the bridge, um, especially wide loads and things like that. And it's a weight restricted bridge, like many of the other bridges we have in Missouri. So basically on this bridge, what you're saying is it's old, so you have to think about when someone's trying to cross it, they kind of go, am I going to make it? Someone's got to wait for another one coming over. And we talk about these are those bridges that we say need to be repaired. When we talk about infrastructure failing, this is one of those bridges. It's time to replace it and remove it out and get another one in because it's not going to last very much longer, right? Absolutely. It was built and modeled for like Model Ts, 
not for vehicles we have today. And we're talking big trucks. So you guys had to yeah. do a lot. And one of the interesting things is you had to figure out how were you going to replace this bridge? Talk about the infrastructure requirements because when we talk about replacing bridges, it's not easy because you can't just say I'm going to take the bridge out because you can't get across what you just described. And it's a challenge to think about how you do that. And so you guys had to get a lot of planners and that's what construction's all about is figuring out how you were going to replace this bridge. Right. So and we wanted to engage the community too because it's an icon for the community here as well. So part of that you start with an environmental assessment and uh, we started that in, in 2012. Um, but we started it without having funding in place. So that was one of the biggest obstacles for us initially was the funding piece of this. Um, we were lucky enough to be awarded a Tiger Grant in 2015 to be able to move forward with this project. So, um, and this is a case for many of the bridges that we have in Missouri. We have 922 bridges in poor condition and just under 1,200 that are weight restricted. So this is a case where we have more needs than we have funding for. And when you talk about funding and bridges like this and, you, and the need to replace them, the challenges right now is you're saying, look, we've got to replace them and we've got to figure out how. And, and, and one of the interesting things is trying to get excitement for doing it, but also trying to get the workforce to do it, to, to get the skills to do that, right? You had to think about how we we're going to get the right people. Right, right. And we used um, a design build procurement technique. And within that, we set um, goals on the project for utilizing a diverse workforce and things like that. And one of the things my team really wanted to do was look towards our future as well and deliver um, STEM, a STEM program with this project. So we engaged the surrounding communities in both Missouri and Illinois to try and build that workforce for the future, help engage those students and get them excited about our industry. And looking at it as a design build project, so to speak, did you work through that as, as with the workforce? Yeah, um, what we did with the design build project is we set some goals in our contract for our contractor to meet as far as um, workforce and these outreach opportunities. But one of the reasons we chose to use the design build procurement method was for the cost certainty and the speed. Like I'd mentioned, we have a Tiger Grant on this project, which comes with its own restrictions and times that are fairly aggressive for getting those funds obligated and awarded. So that, that was one of the primary drivers for us choosing the design build procurement method was that we could get to work quickly. Talk a little bit about your STEM design challenge where you were trying to work a little bit with the students and, and I guess the, the workforce in, in general with this. Yeah, so our team put together a design challenge for the local students in both Missouri and Illinois. Um, we wanted to challenge these students to design an interpretive panel, a monument, so to speak, for us. Um, really capturing the essence of the existing historic bridge. We wanted to capture this um, in a design challenge for these students. And this uh, monument, the interpretive panel, will be placed in a local park here. And one of the exciting things for this is that it really got the kids engaged in a real world activity where they learned about budgets and design constraints because of those budgets and things of that nature. And the best part is, is we're actually going to build the winning design and it will actually be in the park for years to come where they can take their families in the future and say, look what I did when I was in high school. And our thought process behind that was that we would engage these students and get them excited about our industry where they may choose a career in construction someday. So I think what's really exciting about what you did is you're actually getting students involved in the construction industry by doing this project. How exciting has that been for you? Oh, it's been very exciting, very rewarding for me personally. So a lot of the things that we've done throughout the, the project are um, summer camps and we go into um, surrounding schools 
up to six at one point we had six schools participating and we go in there twice a semester and visit with these students we teach them things about um, buoyancy and stability um, driving pile and drilled shafts and they are really getting an inside look at what career opportunities we have in construction so you're actually giving the student the students a chance to really see what a, a future career is in construction so this is something that not only did they have a chance to have winning bids and an opportunity a, w a winning solution in the design build but really getting a chance to see what a future career would be in construction for the next generation and we talk about a shortage you're actually helping them have an opportunity to see what the life in construction would be. Right, and we're not just um, singling out the engineering side of it, we're looking at the trades as well. Oh, and so needed. Trade schools, yes. And we had a career day a couple weeks ago, maybe even a month ago now, where we invited several local schools to come take a tour of the site and hear from our great trade personnel that are on the job and get advice from them on if this is the path you think you're going down, here is a game plan X, Y, Z for you to follow. And it was a very great turnout with a lots of interest from these. And uh, personally to me, one of our favorites, my favorite speakers was one of our young female oilers on the project. And she got up there and really connected with these students. So it was great to, to influence a diverse group of students. When you look at projects like you're having right now and you look at a failing infrastructure, you know, a bridge, and we talk about it all the time, but then you get out there and you say, look, you're encouraging the next generation. We're saying that that's something that has to happen. You're living and doing both ends of it, getting the new skills and repairing infrastructure. How does it feel when you talk about it right now to say, look, we're living and breathing it every day? Yeah, it feels amazing. It's very, very rewarding to be able to, like you said, put forward something in motion to solve a problem today, but also to help be a part of the solution for the future. Well, I have to tell you, Brandy Baldwin, Deputy Project Director of the Champ Clark Bridge, thank you for spending time with me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right, you take care. We'll talk to you soon. Today we have journeyed from the Stark Area Regional Transit Authority to see how infrastructure is being rebuilt in Canton, Ohio. We looked at how it is implementing new services and programs in empowering the next generation of leaders. We saw how Wayne County in Michigan is leveraging public and private partnerships to move critical infrastructure projects along. I spoke with Brandy Baldwin and it was so exciting to hear her work on the Champ Clark Bridge and its STEM program to encourage the younger generation. Hopefully these projects have inspired you and encouraged you on your next project to give you new food for thought and how to rebuild all of your infrastructure. Now we're gonna continue these discussions on the next episode with three more guests sharing their initiatives and programs across the country. But I wanna leave you with some of my final thoughts for today. Nothing can be built in a day. You know what? It's exciting to understand what we have to do, but it takes persistence, collaboration, and creativity. You know, as we've seen all of these bridge collapses, it takes time to rebuild them. We all know there are a lot of pressures in all these projects, and we know there's a lot of frustration in trying to get the Democrats and the Republicans to the table to talk about rebuilding our infrastructure. But I gave you 10 really great ideas and predictions for the technology that's going to help us do that together. We can't do it alone. We need people and processes to make it happen. But when we come together, everything is possible. Look, we saw creative ideas. It takes creative people and creative processes. When we do that, anything is possible. That's what makes the construction industry so amazingly strong and built and with the next generation anything's possible and thanks for watching construct tech tv fierce advocates for construction